Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Chris Taylor, and I am the advocate of the devil. But you know what I don't understand? The Office. Specifically the American version, since I haven't actually seen a single episode of the original. Specifically, the Michael Scott character. I've never been much of a fan of Steve Carell anyways, but in this, he's just a loud, obnoxious, oblivious asshat. He's probably my least favorite part of the whole show so far. Every other character has some redeeming quality to them. Something that stops them from being complete shit. But the boss? He's the driving force behind me having trouble sticking with the series. My roomies and I have gotten as far as the end of season 7 now, and I'm actually looking forward to the last two seasons more than anything else because there's no Michael Scott. That's not my job. Those very same people that I live with pointed out that the entire point of this show is to talk about the positive sides of things. Brian Sargent in particular threw down the gauntlet. Defend Michael Scott. And he's got a good point. There's so much negativity on this here internet, and if I can find some way to convince myself of the goodness within this character that I nigh loathe, then maybe I am worthy of calling myself the devil's advocate. So B. Rand of the North, this one's for you. Today, I defend Michael Scott of The Office. With multiple episodes watched daily, thanks to the internet, and specifically Netflix, I was able to absorb the first seven seasons of this show, and this character, rather than getting bite-sized portions spread out over years. In that way, the arc of the character, the evolution, was observed more quickly. From an outside perspective, pre-office viewings, I would still catch glimpses and see essentially a buffoon with very little redeeming qualities. In fact, if it wasn't for Jim and Pam stealing damn near every scene you see them in, I would probably have walked out of the room immediately, rather than after I was done eating dinner in the living room those few times. I thought they'd be good together. Like PB and J. Pam, Beasley, and Jim. What a waste. But it's difficult to quantify someone's worth in random snippets. It helps immensely to have a clear view of a person from point A to B, from where he or she starts at the series to where he ends up at the end, or at least the end of his inclusion. I'm actually going to surprise myself a bit here in saying that Michael Scott actually knows what the hell he's doing. Yes, those glimpses into his skill are rare, which is probably the main reason why I never saw it with one or two brief glimpses I had seen before, going through his entire tenure of the show, but it's also undeniable. Man, I can't believe I just said that. Seriously though, how many managers did he outlast? How many people in the upper echelons of Dunder Mifflin had to get replaced only for Michael Scott to stick around? In the end, when Mr. Scott finally does leave the show, it's not in handcuffs or by two strong security people throwing him out of the building. It's by his own accord. This is gonna feel so good getting this thing off my chest. You also get a brief glimpse into what actually brought him to the management table to begin with. His ability to make sales. Again, not the main focus of the show, that would be the rest of the people in the office. More on that in a moment. But those few times when he's dealing face to face with his clients, he is quite obviously capable of being a salesman rather than just a manager should the need arise. Dunder Mifflin is a paper company. It's a desk job being on the phone and occasionally meeting face to face with those few customers who have decided not to just bite the bullet and shop at Bureau en Gros. Er, the English version of this is Staples, right? Something like that. Either way, it's a soul-crushing, numb-making, boring job. If you can believe one fan theory, the reason why there's even a film crew at Dunder Mifflin in the first place is that one of the employees killed themselves. And because of the nature of the job, no matter what, someone's got to do it, it's a look at how the lives of their co-workers continue regardless, almost like said person was never there in the first place. I mean, it doesn't explain why shows like Parks and Rec have the same camera stylings, but it's an interesting theory nonetheless. It also helps my second point. Michael Scott is fucking nuts. My mom is crazy. I don't mean, my mom is crazy. <laughs> I mean, we the jury find the defendant. He is absolutely insane! With the accents and the characters, how he gets in the way of everything and practically sabotages all the goodwill that one could be saying about him. And you know what? 
At a job as mindlessly unwanted but still needed to pay the bills as Dunder Mifflin is, you need that. To a certain degree, anyways. You need that extra seat on the crazy train, and you kind of want someone entertaining to go all along for the ride with you. He's the kind of person who's going to take your mind off your job, provide a distraction. And sure, not every bit he does is good, but you know what? Not every bit that anybody does is good. Before doing this, I had another YouTube channel. And while I wouldn't change the experience of it, it wasn't very good. Before that, I had another character based on a nickname I gave myself in high school. Sure, there are a few moments here and there that aren't completely terrible, but it's also not nearly at the quality of what we're doing now. It's the same with the craziness of Michael Scott. He's always playing a character, always doing a bit, and a lot of times, he crashes and burns. But I'm sure there are some people out there who like what he was doing, and if you're one of those people, let me know what the hell I'm missing. There was one thing that did take me completely off guard. It was unexpected and only because I saw the progression of the series, seen it from the beginning without missing an episode, only then was I able to see a glimmer of hope. For all his faults, for all his showboating in front of the camera, for all the metaphorical masks he wears in the public eye, he truly does care about his team. It doesn't get shown often, hell I'd argue that it doesn't get shown nearly enough, but I can't say it's not there. When Jim is finally ready to admit to himself that he's in love with Pam, he says it to Michael. Well, if you like her so much, uh, don't give up. She's engaged. <laughs> BFD, engaged ain't married. Why? Because he's willing to listen and advise. In fact, if you take the time to watch every episode, I'm sure there are one-on-one -on -one moments that he has with damn near every character that shows how much he wants them to succeed, how much he wants them to be happy. I mean, Except the resident HR rep, but he's management. It's almost literally his job to hate HR. The problem with Mike, and I find it's the same with quite a few people actually, is the camera. He's not comfortable in front of a crew of people who are supposed to be observing his work. They're invading his personal space, in a way. But there's also the prospective audience of tens of thousands, if not millions of viewers when the documentary finally airs. Have you seen how quickly people change when the moment they realize that even a small group of people are paying attention to them? Amplify that with a film crew. It's like your brain rapidly rewires itself and not always in a good way. But take the crowd, take the cameras out, and that very same person goes back to normal. Or at least normal for them. At his core, Michael Scott's heart is in the right place. It's just not attached to his head. It's not even just his crew that he cares about. Scott's Tots. I was warned ahead of time that this was one of the cringiest episodes of the show, but for once, I saw it as endearing. I saw this character that I just couldn't understand, and I saw a legitimate effort to improve the lives of other people and not just himself. Of course, in typical fashion, it didn't work, but that's just like life, isn't it? Despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, I do hope I managed to shed some light into the positive aspects of Michael Scott. Whether it be in his ability to do his job better than those even higher up than himself, or just the fact that you never know just what's gonna come out of his mouth, Michael Scott is certainly one of the more interesting characters to be on television. And when the chips are down, and you need a friend, someone you can talk to and who will treat you like a human being, there's Jim. But Michael would come in at a close second. That's not nothing, right? As always, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to keep up with everything we have going on here at Devious Advocacy, and keep the conversation going on Facebook and Discord, both of which you can find links to in the description below. A big Dundee award goes out to those kind souls who are donating monthly on Patreon. I don't actually have a trophy to give you guys, but if I did, I would. But at the end of the day, the verdict is all up to you watching. If you like what you just watched, then show your support by clicking the like button. If you completely disagree, let us know in the comments. Let all of your own views on the subject clash with my own, so that I may proceed to prove you wrong. I drink, and I know things. But for now, in the case of Michael Scott, the defense rests. And made a promise that made us honest, made us realize we don't need a compromise because we, we can have, have it all. Because you made it possible for us to achieve the improbable. Hey, 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 hey Mr. Scott, what you gonna do? What you gonna do to make our dreams come?
Yeah.